Hi, this is Dr. Tim Green, and I'm here with Dr. Ron Baghetto, who is an international expert on creativity in educational settings. He's currently at the University of Connecticut, and he's an associate professor of educational psychology in the NEAG School of Education. Uh, Dr. Baghetto, thanks for taking the time to talk with me today. Thanks for having me, Tim. So here, here's the topic we're going to talk about today, and it's a, it's a new book that Dr. Baghetto has written. Is it out yet, or is it still in press? It is out, um, and I've, I wrote it with my colleague James Kaufman and John Baer as well. And so it just came out with Teacher College Press. I believe it came out in December. Excellent. So um, I have not got a copy of that. I plan on it because I love the topic, and reading the blurbs about it, uh, it's, it sounds like a great book and a very timely one. So the, the topic of the book is Teaching for creati Creativity in the Common Core Classroom. Uh, and if you're a K-12 teacher, I, I'm sure that's a topic that is of high interest to you. So I, I want to start out by talking about why you, why you wrote this book and how it started and how it, how it evolved. Sure. So I think this book really uh, presented an opportunity to look at something that teachers were facing, and yet another kind of curricular constraint, and kind of use it as an opportunity to address some long-standing misconceptions about creativity in education. And so given that, you know, the Common Core is an experience that many teachers were going to face, um, that was kind of an imp uh, impending uh, curricular experience for them, what we wanted to do is use it as an opportunity to talk about how creativity can actually thrive in constraints. And I think that's somewhat counterintuitive for many people. I think oftentimes when we think about standards, we think that that stifles creativity. And so what we wanted to be able to argue is, yes, standards can stifle creativity, but that's not necessarily the case. And in fact, um, many times creativity requires constraints in order to uh, thrive. And oftentimes in life, we need to be creative within constraints. And so, you know, it kind of debunks that whole um, popular phrase, which I really is one of my pet peeves in creativity, the notion of thinking outside the box, when in many cases, what we need to do, particularly in education, is learn how to think more creatively within the box. Mm -hmm. Now, that doesn't um, preclude sometimes needing to develop an entirely new box. But in many, many cases, it's really how can we be creative within the constraints that we're facing. And so what that book offered is, okay, here's the common core standards. What can we do to look at these standards and, you know, kind of approach them agnostically? We, we didn't want to get into the kind of, we didn't want to be advocates or, um, you know, we didn't want to, say, throw them away necessarily. But just basically say, okay, if you're facing this reality where you're going to be uh, working with the Common Core standards or any set of standards, can you still be creative? And if so, what would that look like? And so that was kind of the premise and the opportunity that we wanted to use that book also to introduce teachers to the long-standing 60-plus years of research and creativity that could be applied to teaching and learning. Excellent. You said a, a couple of interesting things in there I kind of like to follow up on. One of them is, and it is, it seems counterintuitive, you, you know, creativity requires constraints. I mean, mm -hmm. I hear that and I'm like, huh? Uh, you right, know. okay. Yeah. And, and other people say that, think that too, I'm sure. Can you go, can you talk a little bit more about right. that? Right, like, so maybe I'll give unpack an that a little bit. Absolutely. I think one of the things, um, one of the unfortunate things with a term like creativity, because, you know, it's so ubiquitous, everybody has their own kind of ideas about it. And even if you look in the thesaurus, you know, one of the first words is originality. And certainly originality is a core component of creativity. But if you look at the way creativity researchers define it, they combine it with task appropriateness as defined within a context. So creativity is not simply originality. It's originality and task appropriateness. And that's kind of a multiplicative relationship. So if you have originality but you don't have task appropriateness, you just have originality. So, for example, a kid who writes... Um, you know, a beautiful sonnet in response to an algebra problem on a test, that would be an original response, but it wouldn't be appropriate for that task. Um, and, you know, what a teacher would want to do is maybe steer that kid to, you know, the language arts teacher, for example. Um, you wouldn't want to necessarily squash that expression, but you'd want to help that kid understand that this isn't the context for creativity. This is or the context for kind of poetic creativity. Now, that doesn't mean you can't be creative in the way you approach that mathematic problem. Right? So it's really about being original but task appropriate, combining those together. And I think oftentimes um, if we think about creativity as only originality, 
then it does seem like something that couldn't make sense in our classroom. It we, it wouldn't under, we wouldn't be able to understand how that makes sense in the context of content standards. Um, and so what, one way that I'm, I guess one way to think about it is creativity is really a combinatorial process and it often combines opposites. And some, some creativity researchers have even talked about this, that when you bring together even the most opposite stimuli, you can often have this emergent property where you, you know, if you think of the term like frenemy, where you bring friend and enemy together, that's, you know, people have people they can identify as their frenemies, for example. And so, such is the case with creativity. It is this kind of combinatorial process, and you can blend things like constraints, which is the task appropriateness, with the originality. So in the context of school, the task appropriateness are the academic conventions and criteria. And the originality would be the kind of spin that students put on it, their own kind of personal spin. So, you know, good teachers already know this. Like, if you ask your students to write a sonnet or a haiku, you know, you're not going to accept a copied haiku. You want them to follow the constraints of haiku poetry, but put their own original content in there. And together, that makes for a creative haiku. And the beautiful thing about creativity is it's defined within a particular context. So in the context of the seventh grade classroom where you're writing haiku poetry, a child's poem could certainly be considered creative, even if it wouldn't make it into the Norton Anthology of Poetry. So I think that is how, um, I think that's actually, you know, again, you know, somewhat ironically, the idea of that kind of constraint is actually liberating for teachers because they can realize, oh, okay, I already have the task constraints. Now I just need to create spaces for my own and my students' originality to be combined with that. So what, taking on that kind of idea of the originality and, and, and the task appropriateness, and uh, how, how do you get teachers to add in that originality when they already have what you said, the constraints there, and they're comfortable with that. What do you do for them to get them to venture into the world of allowing originality? Right. So I think there's a couple of things. I think one um, is why would you spend the time to do that? Um, and A, is it going to take, do I have to throw out everything? And so I think that, again, the nice and beautiful thing about creativity is it can often manifest in very slight changes. So a slight change can lead to a large outcome. And in fact, that's currently the book I'm working on, um, Big Win, Small Steps, which is really about how you can make slight adjustments um, as an educational leader or as a te classroom teacher and actually um, reap pretty powerful outcomes. And so just to give you a quick example, what we talk about in the, in the book of creative, Teaching for Creativity in the Common Core is how you can make these kinds of slight adjustments. And we give an example that came from one of our earlier books of a classroom in China where the teacher gave a standard word problem but what she added to it is a very simple requirement, which was students needed to come up with as many ways to solve that problem as they could. So not only did they have to solve it accurately, they had to come up with as many ways as possible. So they couldn't just, you know, repeat the, the procedure that they learned from their teacher. They, were, they had to generate many. And they generated 15 or more different ways of solving the same problem. Now, when that happens, we know from learning theory, when, when you're able to represent um, a problem in multiple ways, and you, you can learn from your peers and see different representations, you're more likely to have a deeper and more robust understanding of that material. So the benefit of in introducing creativity is it can increase engagement, it can in increase deeper learning, and it can also increase enjoyment, which is not something we should just eschew. I mean, you know, joy, as Aristotle reminds us, is one of the final causes. It's one of the only things that, you know, is a final cause. And so I think the combination of deepened engagement, enjoyment, and understanding is a pretty powerful rationale for why don't we try making these slight adjustments so students can express their understanding in multiple ways, not only to deepen their own understanding, but to potentially enhance the understanding of their peers and their teachers. And I think that's what we all go into education, you know, with that kind of joy of learning and, and curiosity. And there's nothing as powerful and rewarding as is those moments when we can learn from our students and our students can learn from each other. And I think by introducing creativity, we increase the chances of that happening on a daily basis. Excellent. So, you, again, you said slight adjustments can bring about big changes, and you have a book that you're working on right now? Right, with uh, Corwin Press. That's, it's, I have been writing it every morning, so to, you, it's you know, to be published at a later date, I would say. Excellent. We'll definitely look forward to okay. that. Okay. So you mentioned some of the biggest misconceptions. You talked about misconceptions sure. uh, earlier on. I, 
and I'm sure you get asked this a lot, uh, what, what are some of the biggest misconceptions about creativity and fostering it in the classroom that you run across when you talk to teachers or educators in general? I don't want to just say K-12. Right. I want to say educators in general. I would say, and it would just be people in general. There's a, there's a couple things. One is a lot of people feel like they're not creative themselves, and so how could they possibly be creative in their teaching or try to nurture that in their students? And I think one thing to remember is creativity is a human trait. It's, it's something we all have. And because it's a human trait, it's possible to be expressed in any human endeavor. And so the thing about creativity is really recognizing that it is, again, this combination of putting our own spin on, on something that's relevant in a particular context. And so to become an accomplished creative person, you need a lot of domain expertise. And so teachers, by the time they've spent 10 years they're already expert teachers. And so they have the domain expertise to be a teacher, and they're probably already doing things that are very creative. They just don't recognize it as such. Um, so you can be a creative teacher even if you're not very good. It has nothing to do necessarily with one domain, like art. Um, the domain of teaching itself can be a creative endeavor and activity. So I think you know, broadening our conceptions to realize that it's not limited to the arts. It doesn't mean you have to infuse art-based methods into your teaching, although that could be a creative vehicle. You can do it with a piece of chalk and like that math problem and just adding that slight little adjustment. And so I think that's a misconception that it's going to require a lot, that I don't have that capacity, um, when in reality, they, you know, most people already are being creative in daily life. And so I think that's, that's something to think about. The other thing is that, um, you know, going back to that definition, that it's more than originality, that it, that it does um, operate within constraints and that those are defined by a particular social, cultural, historical context. And so something that we've helped, we've tried to do to help kind of dispel some misconceptions, my, co my colleague James Kaufman and I um, have developed this 4C model of creativity where we talk about one of the problems, what we felt, that kind of had people thinking of creativity in a too narrow way was thinking that there's only, you know, these highly accomplished legendary creators and then there's like the everyday creative person who has always the most creative bulletin boards or whatever. And you don't see yourself in either one of those. Um, and so what we wanted to say is there's creativity that happens anytime you learn something new. So if creativity is really anything new and meaningful, then anytime you have a new or meaningful idea, and even if it's not new or meaningful to anybody else, that's a creative experience. So we call that mini-C creativity. So anytime a kid learns something new or an adult learns something new, they're having that moment. Now to rise to everyday level creativity, it often requires feedback. So when a kid shares an idea that's new and meaningful to them but doesn't make sense to everybody else, that's where the teacher can provide the feedback to help them either clarify that or find the right context for it. And so moving from mini-C to what we call little-C creativity is often what we see in school contexts, and anybody's capable of doing that, and that's the role that teachers can play. Now moving from little-C to what we call pro-C creativity, which is highly accomplished professional creativity, requires um, many years of deliberate practice. So usually 10 years or 10,000 hours of deliberate practice. So if you want to become a highly accomplished creative dancer or musician or athlete, then it's going to require putting the time in. There's really no shortcut around that. And then big C or legendary creativity is something that's out of the hands of the creator. That's usually bestowed on creators after they're already dead. And so what we talk about, this 4C model can be really um, helpful in helping teachers and students understand this trajectory of creative development. And you can infuse these kinds of examples within your curriculum. And so if you have a kid who wants to become a writer, you can show them to become a highly accomplished writer, you know, this is the path. And you can read biographies about that. But in the context of this classroom right now, let me help you move from the ideas that you see as creative to those that we can recognize as creative in the context of the classroom or the school newspaper or even, you know, a local um, in short story contest or whatever the case may be. Excellent. Yeah. And that, I mean, that ties into one of the questions I had, how can we foster creativity in the classroom? And that model is perfect. I mean, it's a good framework that teachers can use. I, I, I like that framework. That's excellent. So uh, my last two questions for you, it's an hour. Okay. I, I end with these questions. I, I, I actually started adding this uh, question right here. Who, as you look at your career and how, how you've, uh, where you are right now and and the research that you do, who have been some of your greatest, and I'm calling them influencers? 
Yeah, you know, um, I guess I'm a firm believer, and one of my favorite quotes is from the philosopher Mikhail Bakhtin, who talks about, you know, our ideas are half ours and half someone else's. Right. <laughs> so it kind of fits into with your, with your question there. And I would say there are so many people that have served as that someone else in my thinking, um, you know, including all the students I've ever taught. Sure. You know, I, I've certainly tested out ideas and learned from their ideas and, and carry those with me. But, you know, if I, if I think back, you know, some influencers on me early on have been and, and still today are some of the American pragmatists, the early American pragmatists like John Dewey and William James and Charles Saunders Peirce. You know, the idea that they would say, you know, there's futility in the quest for certainty and the importance of embracing indeterminacy of life experiences and, and, you know, the importance of states of genuine doubt. I think those are really important for us to think about as teachers and, and teachers who want to be creative is that in those moments when, you know, the curriculum is planned meets the curriculum is lived and we, and, or a kid says something completely unexpected that we could have never anticipated, if we could just take time and be present with those moments and kind of look at that state of doubt and, and explore it, just take a few minutes to explore, there might be something there. I think those are signifiers of creative potential. And rather than try to shut those down and get right back to the lesson plan, taking the time to explore that possibility. And I think, you know, that kind of disposition I learned from kind of the, prag the pragmatists. And also the idea of, you know, developing ideas, continually testing the viability of those ideas out. Um, I think that makes sense to teachers, and particular teachers that want to be creative, you know, as they kind of change and craft their practice over time. Um, Maxine Green. Mary Warnock and the late Anna Kraft, who sadly just recently passed away, all talked about the importance of the imagination and more, more specifically the power of possibility thinking. I don't think there's a more powerful question in education and creativity in education than the question, what if? And so I even use that as a mechanism for giving feedback to students. Because again, it just signifies, A, this is a possibility, and B, this is one of many possibilities. So something that I try to do when I teach classes and try to pass on to teachers I work with is to use that as a prompt for giving feedback. So provide, you know, here's what we thought you did well. What if you tried this? And again, it kind of creates this climate of possibility thinking and gets away from try to guess what I want to hear as a teacher. Um, and then, of course, learning theorists, Jean Piaget, Vygotsky, and some of the early creativity researchers, Guilford and Stein, they all talked about kind of the importance of recognizing the subjective experiences of creativity, but also the kind of social, cultural experiences of creativity and how those things work together. And then there's a slew of contemporary um, creativity researchers that help me think about, you know, the role of context, constraints, all these different things, Robert Sternberg, Teresa Mable. Uh, Beth Hennessy, Mark Runco, John Baer, Vlad Glavin, who's, who's a new rising star in creativity. And then, of course, my two closest collaborators, who have been James Kaufman and Jonathan Plucker. Um, and I think just finding people that you can not only bounce ideas off of, but just sit in a room and in five minutes generate more ideas than you can ever fulfill in a lifetime. Once you have identified somebody like that, then my recommendation would be to continue to work with them. And, and that's been the case with Jonathan and James. So I've been kind of fortunate um, yeah. to have them. Excellent. Uh, excellent. Yeah, I, I can completely agree with that. If you can, uh, if you can find someone where you just the ideas flow, that's a great relationship Absolutely. to have. So the last question that I always end with, and you've, you've already talked about some of this stuff, but if you want to give a couple things, if you don't mind. So what advice do you have for educators about integrating creativity in the Common Core? If you could leave us with one, two things, um, that would be awesome. Absolutely. So I would say, you know, first of all, start small. So identify a lesson. What I usually do when I do professional development with school districts is um, I will ask that they, that teachers bring in the lesson plan they dread teaching or something that they've inherited that they have to teach now that they haven't taught before and, and they're concerned about teaching it. So the, there's a reason for doing that. One is if we could breathe life into that dead lesson, then you can do this with anything. And, and just to demonstrate that if you already have a lesson, really it's just about finding these little moments where you can provide students with an opportunity to express their own um, unique twist on something. And so I think starting small and looking at your lessons and saying, okay, what we typically do in teaching is we have these already predetermined outcomes. 
And this is why things like, you know, backwards planning have become so popular. And there's some value in doing that. You know, if you know what the outcomes are and they're clear, then you can map everything backwards, um, including your assessments and your lesson and so on. But the problem is that completely steals out creativity. So what I would suggest doing is flipping that around a little bit and saying, okay, here's some things I want to accomplish in this lesson. I'm going to set a structure up um, to do that, but I'm also going to create these moments where there are going to be to-be-determined outcomes. So like if we go back to that example I gave of the math teacher, when you say, I want you to come up with as many possibilities of solving this problem as possible, you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know how many outcomes are going to emerge and how many viable responses. But you, I think taking that risk of creating those to-be-determined spaces can be really generative and really easy. And I think once you see the power of doing that and how engaging and deep um, the levels of enjoyment and learning can emerge from that kind of work, then I think you'll start developing the courage to um, put a little bit more modifications in your lessons. One way that I've been thinking about this um, in talking with one of my students this term is the idea of like almost like a financial portfolio, if you will. So the idea is maybe you have a couple lessons where you're going to make a slight modification. Maybe you try a couple that are high risk, you know, that are really going to be <laughs> experimental. And you just try a couple of those out in your kind of teaching portfolio and you see, okay, which ones of these work, you know, and if, if the high risk ones don't pay out, maybe you spend more time on the more low risk ones and start developing your kind of capacity and stamina in teaching in more uncertain ways. Because I really believe, you know, it leads to my kind of second component, I, I really don't think we can expect our children, our our students, the people that we mentor to be creative if we ourselves aren't willing to take those risks. And so I think the best way to promote creativity is to model that kind of sensible risk taking in the way we approach life and teaching ourselves. Excellent. Some great, great, great advice. And I like the, the financial portfolio model of, <laughs> uh, to lesson planning and taking risks and adding creativity into it. That's, that's, that's a great idea. So, uh, Ron, thanks for your time and for talking about your book. Again, it's Teaching for Creativity in the Common Core Classroom. Uh, I'll link to it on my website as well as to your website uh, as well so people can get to know you a little bit more in the work that you do. So thanks for taking the time right. to talk to us about creativity. All right. Thanks, Tim. It was a pleasure.